And this is it. This, this is the main square of Samarkand. This in the 1700s and for about a thousand years before it was the center of the world. This is where a lot of the Great Silk Road converged on. It came here. This was the New York of the last millennium. Imagine a city, if you will, that was capital of the Sogdian Empire 300 to 400 years before Christ. The same city then taken over by Alexander the Great, a city poised in the center of the Great Silk Road between India and China, between Africa and China. A city through which traders passed for a thousand years with goods of unimaginable value. And if you thought of a city to meet that definition, it'd be here, Samarkand in Uzbekistan. And I'm standing here at the foot of the gate of the Grand Mosque in Samarkand, which was built for a legendary warrior by his wife, while his warrior was out fighting in India to take control of that territory way back around the year 1300. And who was this great warrior? A man with a limp. Tamar the Lame, known in Europe as Tamerlane. And this, Samarkand, was his capital. And this was his mosque. This was the main square of Samarkand where Tamerlane ruled from. This was the center of the world near the end of the Silk Road. And for most of the time in the Silk Road, this is the center point where markets went to and fro from Persia to China, from Africa to China, goods going both ways, silk one direction, all sorts of things the other. And what an amazing place to be on this sunrise. Always be nice to policemen, I say. Being nice to this one policeman has got me access to the Samarkand main square, these old madrasas and mosques, all by myself. And being able to sit on the top of the minaret, watching down over the square in sunrise without having to hustle and bustle through all the different tourists is amazing and then now to stand here and enjoy the pleasure of the architecture of the madrasas of the mosques of these wonderful buildings and not have to push my way through the hustle and bustle and the yelling of people like me tourists but wow what an amazing place this is. These old madrasas here in Samarkand are just magnificent. The fine tile work, the architecture. It's a stunning place to come. What a great place to be. On the 9th of April 1336, in a town then called Kesh, which is now in southern Uzbekistan, was born a son to a noble family. And he grew to be this man, Amir Tamur. Tamur the Lame, as he was sometimes known, or in Europe, just shortened to Tamerlane one of the greatest and most powerful rulers of Central Asia in that mid-Middle Ages period. His empire stretched from China to India to Europe and included taking over Constantinople, today's Istanbul. And when Europe glosses over the history of the so-called Dark Ages from 500 to 1500, as if nothing happened. This is one of the greatest rulers that existed at the time. And if you want to understand his power, as he used to say, take a look at his buildings. And he instructed in his hometown to be built an enormous castle, which came to be the largest in the world. And this is the remnants. This is the front door. It used to stretch 70 meters in height and across the top was a swimming pool. According to the Spanish ambassador at the time who came in this front door, there was an enormous hall, 150 meters wide and 200 meters long. And it was one of several halls 
in this building. And in the 1300s, when someone came down the Silk Road and pulled up to this magnificent castle, there would have been nothing but awe in their minds and power that made them quake in fear. But now let's look at that phrase, if you want to judge our power, look at our buildings. Well, today, it's a relic. There's a bare skeleton of a front door that has the power to pull a handful of tourists from a few countries around the world. And what this all symbolises, like many things along this great Silk Road, is that cities could once have been great. Buildings, the greatest and mightiest in the world, and power like you could not believe, that they would have thought were going to last for centuries. And a few centuries later, it's but a crumble. It's but dust. It's but waiting for the next generation of leaders in some far off land to be proclaimed the greatest. So you can sit in New York and you can sit in London and you can think that these cities will last forever. But a few centuries later, they might be like this one. I'm here outside the mausoleum of Tamerlane. This is a well-preserved mausoleum surviving a couple of earthquakes over the centuries and inside is the body of Amir Tamur, otherwise known as Tamerlane. It was only confirmed as his body and only found in 1941 as excavations were done under the instructions of Joseph Stalin. Tamur as a king had an enormous empire. It spread from China down through India across to Istanbul verging on the doorstep of Europe. It covered Persia, it covered India and parts of Pakistan. It was an amazing piece of territory in that late Middle Ages period. And whilst Europe was just waking from its slumber of the Dark Ages, this was still a part of the world under Amir Tamur that was a leader in technology, in science, in maths. You know, the way we learned history in Europe, and I include Australia in that, we think of Galileo as the father of astronomy. The guy that first was brave enough to declare the world round, not flat. The problem with that narrative is 200 years earlier, this guy, Mizo Ulugbek, declared the world round and not flat. And because in Europe we think that history is only European history, we actually don't have an understanding of who the father of astronomy was. The father of astronomy was not Galileo, was not Christian. The father of astronomy is Mirzo Ulugbek, who was based here in Samarkand in Uzbekistan. So a couple of hundred years before Galileo, Ulugbek built his astronomy and it's upon those foundations that I stand now. 30 metres above me rose one of the earliest the observatories built in the world. The place where the most accurate measure of the length of the year took place until modern times. The only thing remaining of the old astronomy is the sextant that we can see through this door here. And it's history like this that reminds us that most of the history we learned was written by Europeans. And the Europeans completely whitewashed nearly a thousand years between the year 500 and about the year 1500 that the Europeans called the Dark Ages. And what Europeans forgot is places like this was home of mathematics and astronomy that people had achieved at a far higher level than anything the Europeans had achieved by half a millennium. And it's the arrogance of European history to think that Europe was the centre of the world that really I find quite astonishing. And when you come here and you see what was learned and what was understood by the astronomers and by the mathematicians. And as bad news as it might sound to Western European ears, most of the things that we considered, we invented and we discovered, were actually discovered two or three centuries earlier by the Muslims here in Uzbekistan in Samarkand. Evening from under the statue of Muhammad ibn Musa al Khorizamu, born 783. Khorizam is this province around Hiva, and Hiva used to be the capital. And why do they celebrate this guy from 1300 years ago? Well, 
Back in the Roman days, they had Roman numerals. And what was the Roman numeral for zero? That's right, there wasn't one. And zero is critical for the decimal counting system and cr critical for algebra. Al Horizamu, Al Harab, Algebra is how his name was perfected or anglicized. He perfected algebra. And in perfecting algebra, what he also did was invent the number zero. And you need the number zero for 10, 100, 1000, 10,000, etc. In other words, he allowed the creation of the decimal system. Yet another example of while Europe slept through the Dark Ages, along the Silk Road in the Arab world was invented and all perfected astronomy, science, medicine, and mathematics. There's something I really like about the fact that there can be a UNESCO World Heritage Protected Centuries Old Bazaar that's still a bazaar. I tell you, if you're wandering through a market in an old Silk Road trading town, you can't complain that the hawkers and the sellers are not genuine. It would have been very similar hundreds of years ago. Behind me is the mausoleum of Ismail Shamani. This mausoleum was the first building in Central Asia to be built with baked bricks, not mud bricks. Ismail Shamani was the leader in the 10th century. Following him were the Mongols, following them was Tamil, following them were the Persians again, and then the Russians turned up. Ismail Shamani was originally a Buddhist and his mausoleum here has design hints that reflect that history. A square mausoleum with no main entrance just like most Buddhist temples. Some Buddhist and Zoroastrian traditions have made their way down to modern day. Indeed at weddings in Uzbekistan the bride and groom will walk around a fire three times believing that that will protect their home, harking back to the Zoroastrian fire worshipping traditions. And there are lots of Buddhist clues and hints like this mausoleum, but also when people die here at funerals, they light a candle believing the spirit will go up with the smoke. So Ismail Shamani, whilst he might have been the leader in the 10th century, and his mausoleum survives a thousand years to today, some of the traditions of Buddhism that he believed in also survive to today. Welcome to the Ark Fortress in Bukhara here in Uzbekistan. There's been a fortress or a settlement here since at least about the 5th or 6th century before Christ. Around about the year 1000 AD, Bukhara was the capital of the Samanid Empire and that's when it reached its height, when it was known as Bukhara i Sharif, you know, the holy city, the prosperous city, the place that people would come backwards and forwards along the Silk Road. But like a lot of other places, it was vulnerable to attack from outside. In 1230, Chinggis Khan sacked the city and destroyed almost all of it. And by 1370, Bukhara was a vassal state to Samarkand 
under the great Tamerlane. After the Persians reasserted dominance along the Silk Road and reaffirmed a very closed and insular version of Islam, they placed their own rulers and commanders in each of the cities. In 1753, Rahim was the ruler here, placed by the Persians, and he declared himself emir or king, and created an emirate or khanate. Emirate and khanate is more or less the same thing, emirate coming from the Persian, khanate coming from the Turkish, and ruled a much smaller territory here. And it was the emirates that the Russian Tsarists tried to take over. And the Bukharan emirs did a deal with Tsarist Russia and said, we will support you if you support us. But what they didn't realize is the Tsars were on their last leg and when the Bolsheviks took over in Moscow and St. Petersburg, the deals that they had for protection collapsed. And finally, the last emir, the last Khan here in Bukhara was Sayyid Ali Khan, who ruled from about 1911 to 1920. And because the Tsarist protectors had fallen, when the Bolsheviks came here and bombed the heck out of the place, that was it. It was absorbed in to the Soviet Union. Behind me here is the Mir Arab Madrasa. It was built in the 16th century and funded by the sale of 3,000 Persian slaves. Now, that in itself is a good story, but the other story I like about this, to show again the trade is agnostic. In the late 1940s, Stalin wanted to trade oil with the um, Saudis. The Saudis didn't want to trade because the Soviet Union was an atheist country, so to prove that it wasn't atheist and was open to religion, Stalin allowed for the creation and the opening of one Islamic madrasa, and it's this one here paid for by Persian slaves, and then reopened for the sake of Arabic oil trading. If you ever wanted to go to an ancient city whose walls would remind you of the romance of a bygone day, and be surrounded by history that you'd never ever experienced, then this would have to be one of the places on your short list to go. This is Kiva. These are the old city walls of Kiva. Some say this city was founded by Shem, the son of Noah, when he was walking through the desert and found a well. And given that Noah's ark landed on Mount Ararat, on the border between Turkey and Armenia, a little further down the Silk Road, that story is in fact quite plausible. It very well could have been founded by Shem, the son of Noah. Kiva was an old trading oasis on a side branch of the Silk Road. But the name of Kiva goes down in history for another reason. Here was one of the most brutal of slave markets. On all of the Silk Road, this is the city that people feared the most. After the end of Tamerlane and the breakup of Central Asia to its individual republics, here in Kiva, it was ruled by a brutal Khanate. Peter the Great tried to do a deal with the Khan of Kiva and convince him to fall underneath the protection of the Russian Tsarist Empire. Initially agreed, but in the time it took Peter the Great to send a negotiating panel, he changed his mind. So when the negotiators turned up, he killed them all bar for a handful that was sent back to St. Petersburg with the news. The Russians were to learn their lesson from that first failed attempt to take over Kiva. And when they came in force again in the 1800s, they came with a force of 13,000 men finally quelling Kiva's independence and bringing it under the auspices of the Russian Empire. Later of course into the Soviet Union and finally its independence today as a city or town as part of independent Uzbekistan. Regardless of whether or not Kiva is or is not the home of Shem, the son of Noah, one thing is true. 
The old town of Kiva retains such a charm of mud brick buildings and walls that as you wander through you can't help but being transported back in time, if not all the way to five or six centuries BC, then at least to the 16, 17 hundreds. You get a feeling of the history and a feeling of the authenticity as you look over this magnificent town and see that fantastic architecture that exists in the mosques and the madrasas and the minarets and really just get to soak up the atmosphere of the place. Kiva, or Kiva, well worth visiting. When you get out of Tashkent and pull into the remote parts of Uzbekistan, you very quickly come to the impression that one of the biggest problems here is water and the lack of it. And we all know the Aral Sea is shrinking, but it's largely shrinking because of a decision of Stalin and the Soviets to drain that water, to irrigate this desert to plant cotton. Cotton fields like this was one of uh, Stalin's great ideas of let's use the water resources to create a cotton crop, which means countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan have huge cotton crops and huge fields and they use a lot of water, which is why the RLC is shrinking and why we see a lot of salinity in the soil. Here in Tashkent, under the gaze of Tamerlano, the Amir Tamur, Perhaps we can reflect upon where Uzbekistan is today. Here in Tashkent, it's a very clean city, it's a very friendly city, and it feels very safe. On the surface, you would think there's a great future for Uzbekistan, but there are some challenges. The president who ruled this country from the end of the Soviet Union has recently died, and new elections are going to take place in a month or two. It's the first real democratic test for Uzbekistan since the end of the Soviet Union. And it's going to say a lot about the future for this country. And whilst on the surface the economy looks good, driven by a little bit of tourism and a lot in the resource sector, there are a couple of hints that not all is right in the economics. And those hints are these. The local currency, the SUM, has a black market exchange rate twice that to the US dollar of the official rate, 3,000 versus 6,000. And in my experience, when there is a strong black market growing, and when the automatic teller machines give a currency that's not yours, and most ATMs here only dispense US dollars, then there is a severe question around the inflation and the underlying realities of the economy here. So economic management is a real challenge. And with the upcoming election, politically, it is a real challenge. Nevertheless, Uzbekistan finds itself not just the home of the old Silk Road, but potentially the future one as well. So if you're in your 20s here in Tashkent, the future could either be very good or very challenging, depending on the next few years and how they unfold.